And look, I think that we can all probably improve our diet in some way or another, um, but mm -hmm. eliminating a food or a food group usually is not the answer for most people if it's not necessary. Hey everybody, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein and I'm a registered dietitian based in New York City. It's been a while since I've brought on a dietitian and I wanted to bring back this series so I have some exciting topics and guests lined up for you. And we're gonna kick things off with Chelsea Amer, who is a registered dietitian based in New York City. She does virtual counseling like myself, and one of her specialties is food allergies and intolerances because she herself has a number of food allergies that she's had since she was young. So we are gonna cover that in depth today, among other things. And I wanted to cover this uh, because it comes up very frequently in, in my client work, and I know other people's client you know, nutrition work. And while there are many people out there with legitimate allergies and intolerances, of course, it's, it's very common for people to self-diagnose food issues or even to disguise restrictive eating as an allergy or intolerance, which of course leads to the removal of these foods and other food groups and thus key nutrients. And this is especially problematic among athletes. I do see this among athletes and, and so you know this is something that is important to address. So this isn't to say that you need a medical diagnosis to justify feeling better after you remove a food. Obviously, you can always do an experiment one, and as I always like to tell my clients, you know, let's just make sure that you're finding other ways to get those missing nutrients into your diet. But there is a lot of confusion surrounding this topic, and thus it's a good one to hash out with a dietitian who herself grew up with a life-threatening allergy and who specializes in this topic. So I hope you enjoy my discussion with Chelsea. Uh, we covered a few other things, not just uh, food allergies, but um, you know, we definitely went through some some big parts of this topic, and I hope you learned something as I did. All right, here you go, Chelsea Amer. Hey, Chelsea, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks so much for having me. So today's topic is food allergies and intolerances. And it's been a while since I've actually had a dietitian on. And, you know, aside from my athlete nutrition profiles, I have a series of dietitian interviews where we explore a topic um, that, you know, the dietitian specializes in. So, you know, I immediately thought of you when I was, you know, kind of thinking about having this topic on and, and because you, of course, have food allergies. And um, so, yeah, before we kind of dive into today's topic, can you share a little bit about yourself and your experience living with food allergies and also your background as a dietitian? Absolutely. So I'm Chelsea Amer. I'm a registered dietitian and I own my own private practice and consulting company, Chelsea Amer Nutrition, based in New York City. And I really help two main types of clients. The first one are individuals with food allergies and help them navigate what to eat to feel good without feeling deprived, which is a big issue with individuals with food allergies. And then I also help women eliminate confusion about what to eat to help them feel good through food also without restriction or deprivation. So I help those two main types of clients. And then I also work with brands to help communicate their nutrition messages through recipe development and other media collaborations. And... Essentially, my business is sort of like a three-ring circus going on. There's always something. There's I wear a lot of different hats, but I wouldn't have it any other way because I absolutely love doing what I do and communicating nutrition information to the public as well as my clients. So that's sort of what I do as a dietitian. But then personally, being a dietitian is extremely personal because I was diagnosed with food allergies to tree nuts, peanuts, and sesame seeds when I was under five years old. The age range fluctuates whether I ask my mom if it's two years old, three years old, I'm not 100% sure even. Mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. pretty much been my entire life, and it's all I know. So it's easy to feel really deprived and restricted when you're constantly reminded that you can have something or it's not safe to eat. It's much more difficult for individuals with food allergies to just go out and grab lunch or grab breakfast at or feel safe eating in a restaurant. So I really like to empower individuals with food allergies to help them figure out what to eat. And that's why I became a dietitian. And now it's really rewarding to help other kids and adults with food allergies also get creative in the kitchen and learn how to cook with their allergies. Um, as far as mm -hmm. my experience living with allergies, it's really interesting because my whole life I was told that I was anaphylactic to all tree nuts, peanuts, and then just highly allergic to sesame seeds. But actually when I was pregnant or a little bit before I was pregnant, I have an eight-month-old son, 
And when I was pregnant, mm-hmm. I really got concerned about how I was going to feed him. There's a lot of research now about early introduction for babies to common food allergies like peanuts. So introducing between the ages of four and eight months is really ideal. Mm-hmm. And introducing it early and then often to help reduce the incidence of peanut allergies and also egg allergies. Those have the most research behind them as far as the common allergens. And so I got really concerned about how I was going to feed my son. So I actually got my allergies retested. And it turns out that I must have outgrown um, some of my food allergies to certain tree nuts and peanuts and sesame seeds. But through the blood work and a skin prick test, but those aren't 100% conclusive. So in order to really figure out where my allergies stand now, I would have to do an oral challenge. And as somebody who's been told that like cashews and almonds and walnuts can kill me, it's really daunting (laughs) eating it and doing an oral challenge. So I haven't done that yet. My husband has been great introducing peanuts and my allergies to my son for now, but it, you know, it's a little bit, comforting to know that maybe my allergies have lessened since they weren't like alarming in my blood work and the skin prick test, but still it's very nerve wracking. So I still consider myself 100% allergic to those foods until I do the oral challenge, which is how my allergist described it to me. And I mean, I'll share a little bit about myself as well on this topic because uh, I'm highly allergic or well, supposedly to shellfish. And my response is anaphylaxis as well. And supposed to carry an EpiPen, the whole thing, although I always forget when I'm switching bags to put it in a yeah. different bag. My husband always yells at me. I have like EpiPen stashed everywhere, but you know, yeah. um, my, my path was a little bit different because I ate these things growing up, um, you know, all shellfish, not like frequently, but you know, I ate them somewhat regularly and I didn't become allergic until I was 22. And my dad has like his reaction to shellfish is like hives. But at 22, I was in grad school and, and I, um, just felt, I got this weird rash and I felt really horrible and, and like over the course of a day basically had like this like slow motion anaphylactic, you know, reaction essentially. And they tested me and said I was, you know, allergic to shellfish. So, but similarly, they told me at some point you should, you know, retest or do the oral challenge, you know, they're like, yeah, you know, just boil shrimp at home. And t-. I'm like, yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> I'm not really oh, wow. interested. They told you to do it at home. That. That's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, this is some random nurse when I was at Yale. I mean, I don't know. I haven't, I have not gone to like an allergist. I just have been like, right, no shellfish. It's out. I'm done. You know, and although to be fair, I haven't really been super careful about cross contamination and, you know, knock on wood, I've been okay. So I've always been curious. I'm like in my travels to Asia and in like all these, all the sushi places I've been, like, I must have been exposed to some degree of like you know, some cross contaminations. I'm always curious about it. But when you talked about the oral challenge, it reminded me, I'm like, oh yeah, I really am supposed to <laughs> do that. But yeah. my, um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, we're getting a little off, well, not really off topic, but a follow-up question when you were talking about introducing allergens to babies um, or, you know, to, to young kids, is shellfish one of those ones that we are also supposed to be introducing at a very young age? Because we have still not introduced to our th- almost three-year-old, and I keep meaning to, and it's just like, uh, I did everything else but that. It's uh, it's bad. <laughs> no, it's not bad. Um, at this time, the research actually isn't there. The studies have really been done with peanuts and eggs are the most significant, where if you introduce early and often, it does reduce the incidence of the allergy. That's what we know at this time. I'm sure more studies are being done with all of the top eight allergens. Um, yeah. But- Right now, I would, they say you could introduce shellfish really at any age. It doesn't really matter, but the research isn't there in terms of reducing the incidence of an allergy. Sure. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, in my family, the allergies tend to manifest later in life, you know, Mm -hmm. in in my, in other people we've seen and we have celiac in our family and, you know, other things, but everything was later in life. So it's, it's interesting to kind of see the the, you know, more pediatric allergies or the, or even in babies versus like, you know, in your twenties, thirties, forties and how that works out. But, um, this isn't my specialty, which is of course why I wanted to have you on and, and Mm -hmm. kind of talk about the science and kind of all the daily life stuff. So, um, maybe, you know, let's, let's start with some basics here. I mean, I think, you know, many people out there, they know what an allergy is, but that word intolerance, you know, I, I, at least in my experience, many of my clients seem to use those two words, allergy and intolerance interchangeably, but they are of course 
very, very different. So can you just walk us through what the difference is between allergy intolerance and, you know, kind of list some common ones that we, we find in clients? Absolutely. So this is a big one, very confusing topic, and I love clearing it up. So I'm really glad that you asked so we can set the record straight. So the primary difference between an allergy and an intolerance is in the immune system's reaction mechanism. And then what clients will describe as their symptoms also is a big way to sort of tell the difference in addition to the testing that they get done. So an allergy, a true food allergy, is what's called an IgE mediated reaction. It's an immune reaction. It's usually immediate within a couple of hours. I know you said it happened like over the course of a day, which is actually like a little delayed and you can have a delay onset. Um, at like anaphylaxis, that's totally a thing and possible, but usually, um, an allergy, especially an anaphylactic allergy would be an immediate reaction. It can be life threatening and it has, your symptoms will usually be hives, itching, um, a rash, diarrhea, vomiting, and then feelings of anaphyl- symptoms of anaphylaxis could be your throat closing or like impending feelings of doom, even like something really is wrong, um, are all mm-hmm. symptoms of what would be an allergy or an anaphylactic reaction as well. And that's to you have an allergy to the protein that's found in a food. So you're having the allergy to the peanut protein, the protein found in shellfish. And intolerance, on the other hand, a lot of times, not always, and there's all, I can talk about different examples, but a lot of times it's not necessarily to the protein itself, um, but just to the food as a whole and can be to the other macronutrients in the food, like the carbohydrate. Um, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it's a slower reaction and intolerance. It's not life-threatening, but it usually has a more annoying symptoms than life-threatening symptoms, like stomach upset, nausea, bloating, bowel changes. These are really annoying symptoms. They're lifestyle symptoms, and nobody wants to live with them. So it's good to identify intolerances, but you're not having usually like highs, rashes, vomiting, um, you know, like anaphylactic, life-threatening reactions, which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The best way to think about the difference between an allergy and an intolerance is to look at the difference between an individual with a dairy allergy and then somebody with lactose intolerance, for example. Somebody with a dairy allergy is allergic to the protein found in dairy, and they will have rash, itching, um, hives, diarrhea, vomiting. Somebody who is lactose intolerant is intolerant to the carbohydrate And they don't have the enzyme to break down the carbohydrate in their digestive system. So they usually somebody with an intolerance can tolerate a low lactose diet or no lactose products that are still dairy. But somebody with a true dairy allergy cannot tolerate milk or any form of dairy. And they both really they both are significant. They both are real and the they need to be addressed in slightly different ways. But they can impact somebody's life, but they're very different, and it's important to know the difference also. Also, a lot of times, the testing, there are now all these, like, um, IgG, which are, when I say Ig, it's an immunoglobulin. It's part of your immune system. So IgE is for an allergic reaction, a true allergy. There are a lot mm-hmm. of IgG tests out there, which aren't exactly validated and always accurate. And a lot of times we see clients come with like a long list of things that yes, they're yes. intolerant <laughs> to. Um, I guess you've had experience with that too. Yes, um, yes. They're like, so I can't I'm, eat anything. I'm like, yeah, that's BS. Don't, don't pay attention to it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's some, I don't like to say that it's BS because there's some validity okay. if somebody's having symptoms to it, you know, well, of course, if somebody's having the symptoms, you know, it's very valid. And, you know, one of those foods that they might be intolerant to might be triggering their symptoms, but it's not a true allergy. And so we sort of have to take those tests with a bigger grain of salt versus if somebody's having like an IgE mediated allergic reaction. Sure. And I mean more like the person who comes to me without symptoms and right. they're saying, but my blood, but this test tells me I can't eat any of these foods. That's when I'm like, yeah, that's, yes. you're fine. <laughs> Obviously if someone's having symptoms and, and, and that's, you know, you know, we don't have to always have like a medical, a true medical diagnosis to justify you feeling better after removing any kind of food. Like if you do an experiment of one and you feel better after you remove some sort of food, you know, that's fine. You know, as I always like to tell my clients, we just need to make sure that you're getting those nutrients from somewhere else. And, you know, and as you work with people, it's not feeling deprived not feeling restricted, you know, so, um, you know, that's, that's an important one. And of course, the other thing we, we see, and, and, you know, we can talk about this now or later on is, you know, a lot of people, or at least I've seen some, you know, some people use 
allergy or intolerance as an excuse to be restrictive and to kind of mask uh, disordered eating. Um, oh no, I can't have any gluten or, oh no, I get you know bloated and do this and that. And whether it's true or not, because, you, you know, I'm sure you, you know, you're aware of how that connection, that gut, that gut brain connection. And, and if you believe something enough, it's like, okay, well, you know, there's almost like a mental thing going on there, but, um, but often it's just an excuse. So, that's like the whole other side of allergies and tolerances. There are people who absolutely have, you know, genuine issues. And then there are other people who try to hide behind that language, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if you see that a lot or kind of how you deal with that. But um, I know at least like in the athlete population, that's something we encounter for sure. Like, and that's kind of, you know, mixed into all the fad diets and stuff. Yes, I'm sure it's much more popular in the athlete population. I, the people I see usually come to me with some form of a test done and symptoms that they're really having some sort of allergy or intolerance. But I do see it in the subset of women that I work with who are just looking to improve their health on a more general scale. Maybe they became yeah. vegan or plant-based because somebody told them to. And so they're restricting their diet just for the sake of restriction versus yeah, yeah. when nothing was wrong in the first place with how they were feeling from the foods they were eating. And look, I think that we can all probably improve our diet in some way or another. Um, but mm -hmm. eliminating a food or a food group usually is not the answer for most people if it's not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you were, we were talking about lactose intolerance. So let's just rewind for a second there. Um, I know that some people, this is a little off topic, but I wanted to bring it up because we often see people talking about dairy. And again, like I see this all the time in athletes, you know, avoiding gluten, avoiding dairy, all these different things because they believe them to be, you know, quote unquote bad. Um, so, you know, how, how do you feel about dairy um, kind of separate from intolerance or if you have any kind of opinion on that? Um I mean, I personally love it and it really plays, you know, not like a huge role. Like I don't like you know, eat tons of it. I don't recommend people eat tons of it, but I, I do love dairy and, and include it in my recommendations and in my own diet. So I'm always curious what other dietitians have to say about that. I don't have a problem with dairy at all, as long as it's well tolerated. Um, I usually mm -hmm. do prefer, you know, I do recommend like high quality organic sources when possible, especially for kids, but I otherwise don't really have an issue with it. And the organics, is like a whole separate conversation. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but dairy and meat is just something that I personally feel that we should try to eat organic when possible. Of course, it's not going to be 100% of the time, but that's just my personal beliefs and professional what I recommend when it's financially possible and feasible. But I also think dairy is one of those convenient foods. It's so it's much harder to create a really convenient meal plan without dairy, like yogurt, cottage yes. cheese. Yes. Um, yeah. regular cheese they're really easy to take on the go and so and they add tons of flavor to food like if you add a sprinkle of cheese to something you totally elevate probably because of the fat content you're totally elevating the flavor of whatever food you're eating so I think that it's a really yeah. good way to feel satisfied from your foods while adding tons of good nutrients like calcium and vitamin d and protein so I'm on board for dairy. Personally, I've had to be dairy free for the past eight months. My son has milk protein oh, no. intolerance. It's so hard. I miss cheese, but, um, he actually, we tested yogurt. He could eat it. So I think he's going to be okay. It's very common. Okay. And then babies usually outgrow it, but mm -hmm. the mom has to be dairy free while nursing. So it's definitely been a long eight months of me not eating oh. cheese. <laughs> oh my God. I think I would die without ice cream. I would go nuts. Although I guess there's some pretty good vegan options out there, but yeah. although they're nut based, so you can't eat those either. Most of them are Cause it's like cashew. Yeah. Oh man. That's rough. I'm not I'm a big ice cream. Hopefully you get back. So to oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, I, I, as again, like kind of, I work with a lot of athletes and, and, you know, being able to like get back from a run or a workout or, you know, and have like Greek yogurt and fruit, you know, when you're not too hungry and then have a meal a little bit later or bring, you know, if you're at the office and you can just like grab a cheese stick or yeah, like a small thing, yogurt or kashi, it's just such an easy snack. Um, an easy way to get protein in. So not to say that you need it by any means, we can absolutely like work around it, but it is an easy one and a nice one to include and delicious in my opinion. Um, okay. So another big one um, is of course uh, gluten. So we couldn't talk about allergies and tolerances without talking about gluten. Um, so there is of course celiac disease, which is the actual allergy and uh, gluten intolerance or insensitivity, which we also hear a lot about and 
Um, you know, and this is not anything new, you know, this has been on the rise for years and years, you know, the whole gluten-free diet is, uh, you know, something that has been around for a while. So, um, but I did want to go through it because I still do think that there's some confusion around gluten. I still get clients coming to me who avoid, you know, I I see in their food log, that's like gluten-free pasta. And I'm like, oh, why are gluten-free bread? I'm like, oh, just out of curiosity, why are you doing gluten-free bread? Oh, I thought it's healthier for you okay. (laughs) Are you like, do you have any issues? No. So maybe we can clear some stuff up there. And again, kind of go through some basics of what is celiac versus a gluten intolerance or insensitivity. And um, why do some people believe gluten is bad? Let's clear that up as well and kind of go through that. Yeah. So gluten is a protein that's found in wheat, barley, and rye. And it's gotten a lot of hype in the last, I would say maybe 10 years that, you know, that it's inflammatory, that it's bad for you. And I definitely think it's over vilified in the media. Um, But I don't think that we all have to avoid it. And I don't think that it is the devil. You know, like I get people who are so afraid of gluten. 1% of the population has celiac disease, which is the true autoimmune reaction to gluten. And it does, the only treatment is 100% avoidance of gluten, including even in very, very small amounts that can happen from cross-contamination. Other people may actually be intolerant to gluten, but oftentimes I find that people who say that they're intolerant to gluten and eliminate gluten-filled products, they're eliminating a lot of overly processed grains, which mm-hmm. are often accompanied by those other inflammatory foods like sugar. Um, yep. So like they're also eliminating like the office cupcakes and they're eliminating cake and you know certain candy that might also have gluten in it. So when you're eliminating... And then they're also eliminating beer a lot of the time. So if somebody's a big beer drinker, you know, the alcohol, they're eliminating all these other foods when they become, when they eliminate gluten, if they say that they have an intolerance, but they're really eliminating foods that, you know, aren't necessarily healthy to be included in an everyday diet. So they're eliminating a lot of overly processed grains and sugar that That are pro-inflammatory too. Right. That we don't necessarily need in our everyday diet. So If you focus, though, on like real foods that are high quality whole grains, they're filled with tons of health benefits. So a lot of times people won't react if they have farro on their dinner plate. But if they're having tons of bagels and, you know, white bread and cupcakes and like it's shocking where gluten creeps in and tons of like condiments, you know, you're you might just be overdoing it on that food group, I would say, versus then if you eliminate gluten, you're really just cutting back on your processed grains. Sure. And, and, and there's of course nothing wrong with having any of those foods. No, like you absolutely. can absolutely do it, but, 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 you know, sure. Like I'll get someone coming in to be like, Oh, you know, I have so much bloating with bread or with whatever, you know, food with gluten. And then I'll look at their log and it's like, they ate like a gigantic quantity. And I'm like, I hate to say it, but I think anyone wouldn't feel so great after eating that meal. I think you just ate too much in that, yeah. you know, in that circumstance or they'll, you know, say they, they have a reaction to gluten and then we'll like look and, and you know, more, you know, dig a little deeper and actually they're fine with certain, they're like, Oh, well I can eat this, but I can't eat that. I'm like, well, those both have gluten. In them. So, and so I think, I think identifying the foods that actually contain gluten and, and clarifying, as you said, that, you know, often gluten is found in, in certain foods, beverages that are pro-inflammatory. So it's not gluten itself that is, you know, inflammatory. You know, the science isn't really backing that up so much, or at least from what I've seen, maybe you've seen differently. But but yeah, there are other things going on. And of course, other lifestyle things like stress and, and sleep. You know, there are all these other things that obviously affect our, our health status, and we can't just, you know, vilify a single nutrient like that. Um, so, I totally agree. Okay. If somebody's having like an has an inflammatory disease or has like gut dysbiosis, you know, sure. SIBO is becoming a yeah. very popular um, thing that GI doctors are looking for. I do think you know mm-hmm. it might be a high gluten diet may not be tolerated, but if you're eating a yeah. bagel for bre- like if you're picking up a bagel on your way to breakfast or a muffin, and then you're having a sandwich at lunch, and then you're having yes. Yes. pretzels for your snack, you just might be overdoing it on the highly processed forms of gluten. And instead, I would really encourage you, you know, switch to a sprouted grain bread that might be digested a little bit better. Switch to whole grains instead of processed white grains. You know, instead of having a bagel or a muffin, maybe have some oatmeal for breakfast, you might just 
tolerate those foods better and yeah. it might not be gluten. And then you might be able to have your cupcake every once in a while and really yeah, enjoy sure. it instead of feeling like you're scared to eat it because it does contain gluten. And I think it's a hundred percent should be individualized. You know, we're, if you're unsure, work with a dietitian who works with this, really take, you know, note of your symptoms, keep a food record, see how you feel and see what else is going on. Like you said, stress, sleep, these are all things that also impact what we eat and how we feel. Exactly. And, and I, I, you know, when I was doing some research a while back, I was looking at various diagnoses and like, or, or looking into the whole like gluten sensitivity or gluten intolerance and the rise of that as like a kind of diagnosis and some medical professionals saying like, that's not a true diagnosis. It doesn't really exist. Or I don't know, like, do you have any thoughts on that kind of thing? Or did you, have you come across anything specifically on that? No, oh, I think somebody can be intolerant to gluten. I do. I think like there are some people where certain foods just don't agree with them as well as others. Um, it's not always, however, the gluten itself, sometimes for some individuals, for example, individuals with IBS, they might be think that they're intolerant to gluten, but they might really be intolerant to like the carbohydrate. The gluten is the protein that's for, found in wheat, barley, and rye. They might really mm -hmm. be um, intolerant to the carbohydrate, which would fall under like a FODMAPs category. So following like yeah. a lower FODMAP diet does eliminate a lot of those gluten filled grains, but that might actually be the issue, not the gluten itself. So I think it's important if you're unsure and if you're having symptoms that you seek help and you, if you're not satisfied or if you're confused by an opinion, keep seeking help. Yeah. Do you work with FODMAP clients or no? Do you do like uh, yeah. elimination type stuff? I have before. It's not my specialty, but I actually personally went through it. So when I was personally oh, wow. going through it, I had SIBO and I had a ton of, um, I have a extensive medical history and I was actually on antibiotics for a long time. So oh, I had okay. huge okay. gut dysbiosis and then I had SIBO, which is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So I ended up, and I've had like IBS my entire life. So I ended up doing the protocol myself and learned a lot. And when I first became a dietitian, I was talking about it on my Instagram and I worked with several clients with it, but it's now it's not the bulk of the work that I do. Yeah, no, that's something that I'm like, I'm familiar with it, but I would usually refer out because that is GI is not like my, my yeah. big specialty. Although of course, like, you know, we do, especially with athletes, obviously GI issues, it's very common. Um, although, you know, that's a little bit different. That's more tolerance while you are exercising and not necessarily like IBS, IBD, that kind of stuff. Um, anything kind of else you can think of that might be relevant or interesting to my listeners, um, regarding gluten or celiac or dairy or any of that kind of stuff. I think I had a train of thought and I totally lost it, by the way, on gluten dairy, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I just think it's really important that people know that what you eat should be individualized. Just because your coworker eliminates gluten or dairy doesn't mean that that's what's best for you and your diet. And if you do just start eliminating one thing after another or trying one thing or another, it's important to look at your nutrients and what you're eating. Like if you're eliminating dairy, are you still getting enough calcium, which is especially important for women of childbearing age. It's important um, for teenagers. It's just, it's really important that you make sure that you're getting enough of the nutrients that are found. And if it's not, if you're not having a well-planned dairy-free diet, for example, or gluten-free diet, you might be missing key nutrients and you don't want to deal with those effects later. So really make sure that you're having a well-planned diet if you are eliminating a food group for whatever reason and working with a professional is really the best way to do that. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think it's also, you know, if you find yourself restricting, you know, it's, it's important to ask why, you know, why, why is this food being removed? Um, and you know, if it is coming from a place of, of disordered eating, obviously it can be hard to, uh, be self-aware, you know, but, um, and that's of course, if you are seeking help, like we can help you with that. But, um, but, you know, in other circumstances, just making sure that, you know, you are understanding the why is this something that really doesn't make you feel good. And yes, you know, what are you missing and what can we change to make sure that you are getting a varied and, and adequate diet? Um, totally. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think I think this is a big one. Um, and then, you know, again, within the, um, you know, athlete population I, I work with, you know, it's it's I just see a lot of unnecessary restriction. Um or people just, you know, having all these like really random foods that they they believe they're um, they're having some sort of adverse reaction to. So it's it's a good one to to explore. Um, awesome.
Awesome. So that's food allergies. I think we kind of did a little, in a nutshell, kind of introduction to that. So let's change gears now. You, as you mentioned, do recipe development and your Instagram feed is like gorgeous and filled with so many beautiful pictures and amazing recipes. So yeah, tell me a little bit about, you know, what you enjoy creating and, and, you know, what recipe development looks like for you. I know you work with certain companies, um, and, but yeah, maybe you, and I, I definitely will be asking you to share some recipes with my listeners. So I'll put that in the show notes, but yeah, what, what does that look like for you in terms of your recipe development? I'm always curious about, you know, myself, I do just one-on-one work right now. I'm not really doing consulting, but I know, um, you know, many dietitians do like recipe development, and other consulting work with companies. So yeah, give us some insight on that. Yeah, it's probably, I love working with clients, not to like take away from that by any means, yeah. but it's probably the most fun part of my job because it's so creative and I've always loved cooking. I grew up cooking in the kitchen with my mom, my dad, my grandma. So it's something that just is very natural to me to do. So I absolutely love creating recipes and I really just got inspired by either an ingredient or, you know, something that I taste in a restaurant or while traveling or something that I, people ask me for on Instagram now. So I really try to find inspiration from a lot of different sources. I love looking through old cookbooks and seeing how I can maybe make a recipe a little bit healthier or put my own twist on it. I rarely follow recipes myself, but I love Mm -hmm. to take a recipe and then make it my own. So I'll be inspired by something and then twist everything around, Yeah, uh, yeah. which I also have to do and always had to do. And I saw my mom do for my own food allergies. You know, a sure. lot of these recipes are made with almond flour or have nuts in them. And it's how can you change that to be a safe recipe to eat? So I guess it comes with the territory of having food allergies too. Um, yeah. This, I really like to, I share one new recipe a week and then I have now have hundreds and hundreds of recipes that I've created over the years. But I really try to share one new recipe at the beginning of every week. And I keep it simple. My recipes are allergy friendly. They're quick, they're delicious, and they're made for busy people who don't have a lot of time to slave away in the kitchen. So I created actually last year, I released an entire ebook of 50 recipes that all have five ingredients and are made in 20 minutes or less. Five ingredients plus salt, pepper, and oil. But I figured everybody has salt, pepper, and oil in their kitchen. So I didn't count those. But yeah, um, awesome. It was a really big challenge to make 20 minute recipes with only five ingredients, but it, it, people don't have much time. They don't want to be shopping for extensive lists a lot of the time and they want to feel good. So all the recipes yeah. were healthy. They were balanced, a lot of allergy friendly recipes. Um, yeah. So that's what I aim to do. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I definitely love to cook, um, but I I don't consider myself like an amazing cook by any means. I just kind of like assemble or throw things together. And sometimes I follow recipes. Like I have uh, the, I don't know if you've seen the run fast, eat slow cookbook by Shalane Flanagan, Elise Kopecky, but that's a really good series. And some of their, it's just, it's very, they're a little labor intensive, let's just say some of them and a lot of (laughs) different ingredients. They're certainly not five ingredients or less. Um, but but yeah, no, I, you know, but I enjoy kind of doing simple things and, and I'm, like you said, I, I don't really follow recipes either. I just kind of randomly throw stuff together. So everyone's like, always I'll, I'll post something and it's nothing special, but everyone's like recipe. And I'm like, uh, I think this is what I did. <laughs> I don't know. And then th- I did this and it actually tasted horrible. So don't follow this one. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I have clients all the time asking for like, Oh, you know, can you send me some recipe ideas or cookbooks? And I'm just like, um, this is really not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> so I will have to point them your way because yeah. I've always admired what you post, which it looks great. Um, awesome. And you're, of course, a new mom. You know, you have a son who's eight months and and here you are still like, you know, cooking all this stuff. And and actually, I remember you were on maternity leave. I think you must have you maybe you scheduled stuff. But I was just like, wow, you got all this stuff going out and you're like a well-oiled machine with all your Instagram stuff. It was very impressive. <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> about kind of new motherhood and and what that journey's been like as a dietitian and and I mean you shared a little bit about the allergy part but um yeah anything you want to kind of share about your experience being a mom now it's hard (laughs) I've worked with many postpartum moms and I have a completely new respect for all of them I mean I always respected them and new motherhood was hard seeing my own mom and my mother-in-law but 
it's really hard, the sleep exhaustion. And if you're breastfeeding, that's like, it's just a beast to conquer. And even eight months in with a baby who sleeps through the night, I don't feel any more rested or barely feel any more rested than I did a few months ago when he wasn't sleeping through the night. Um, but, and, and it really does impact you, you know, a lack of sleep as a dietitian, I know what a lack of sleep does to you nutritionally. You know, you have yeah. increased carbohydrate cravings and sugar cravings, and you know, you, you don't make the best nutrition balance, nutrition decisions, maybe that really help you feel good. But instead you are looking for that quick fix. And I was never really like that before in my eating, but now mm-hmm. I really do find myself gravitating towards sugar and carbohydrates a lot more. So a lot of times I need to keep myself, you know, be like, this is going to lead to a sugar crash. Cause if I, when I'm home with him, I'm only working part time right now. So I'm home with my yeah. son a couple of days a week. And by two, three o'clock, I'm wiped, usually chasing after my very fast crawling. <laughs> Just wait till he walks. <laughs> I, I can only, I think he's going to be walking before one. So I'm going to be in. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Fine. it's, you know, chasing after it's exhausting. And, you know, yeah. I'm, Diet people think like dietitians have like these superhuman powers where like they don't want a sweet treat or anything like that. And no, it's actually been like pretty difficult to navigate and figure out. And my post, my pre baby body is definitely not back. And I'm just trying to give myself a little bit of grace with that. Oh yeah. And, and it's a long road. I mean, I, you know, of course I have, well, I have my, my daughter, older daughter's string three on Tuesday. And so in a few days and yeah, thank you. Um, which is crazy. That's so three years. Wow. Um, and then my youngest is like four and a half months. And, you know, I've been kind of posting a little bit about my, my own postpartum fitness journey, which is like so slow compared to last time, which is fine. And I'm honestly, I'm, I mean, it's very hard in different ways. I know a lot of moms who are like, Oh, second time around, it's like so much easier. And like, really? yeah, you kind of know what to do. Well, well, it's, it's easy in some ways. And because, well, first of all, you, not that you care less, but you don't stress out quite as much. Sometimes. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, that's fine. You know, she just licked the floor or whatever. Um, but, uh, but, um, you know, it, it's, you kind of know what to expect to some degree. Obviously every kid's different, but, um, but I, I, all the things that are challenging are equally challenging, if not more so. She's definitely like my baby, she's still not sleeping or we've been sleep training for the last three weeks and it's been hell, but, um, Ah. but yeah, it's, it's it's very, it's very difficult. And, but in terms of like all the food stuff, like I think the initial weeks, unless someone brought food by, or, you know, we sometimes got delivery, but like literally we, we were so wiped by the end of the day. Like we were just like, toast for, I wasn't even, I was like toast for dinner. Sure. You know, it's like whatever. And, and here I am giving all this nutrition advice. I'm like, I'm only human and and I'm like embracing the rest of it. I I mean, I'm a big sweets person. I love my sweets. I love my ice cream. I have a scoop of ice cream pretty much every single day and like some chocolate after lunch. And that was, that's just like how I am normally. So, um, I'm just like, yes, I feel it a little bit more when I'm tired, but I'm, I'm kind of just embracing it. But I see you know, people always assume you know, just because we're dietitians, we don't want, you know, some of these foods, even my sitter's like, oh, well, you know, she's been helping with some cooking actually, which is amazing. Um, but she's like, oh, well, this has, you know, some process this. I'm like, I don't care. It's fine. <laughs> you know? it in. It's fine. Um, not everything has to be like absolutely, you know, fresh, unprocessed whole foods. Um, you know, obviously like we're, we're trying to include lots of good stuff, but again, not, it doesn't have to be hundred percent. So, so yeah, I, okay. I feel you. I feel you on the motherhood stuff. It is hard and I wish I could say it gets easier, but as they always say, it just gets different. Um, yeah. But having two is awesome. And um, I'm certainly like really appreciating the baby snuggles this time around because my toddler is like, she'll just like run away and she's in a big daddy phase. And, you know, yeah. as they get older, it's like they're, they'll push you away. <laughs> they won't give you yeah. hugs and I'm like, but anywho, um, and you also, you know, this is of course also a, a sports theme podcast, so we have to talk about working out and all that. You have a Peloton, is that right? I do. We just got it in January. I felt like I was one of those like New Year's resolution pr- people. I was like, I'm oh, not. We're just getting. It's just January. the timing. This you just, got this this past year, like last month. Yeah, we've only had oh, it for a couple amazing. of months. Do you like it? Um, so, okay. So to be fair, I was never a big spinner at okay. spinning. is like not my thing. I was always the person who like goes to dance classes, That's but so cool. I just wasn't getting to classes when I had, after having my son and I wasn't motivated to put on like a DVD, like I've done in the past. I was that girl in college who like put on like cardio kickboxing DVDs and <laughs> made everyone yeah. in my sorority do them together. And sure. 
like in after college and grad school, I was always like working out of my apartment. People yeah. below me probably hated me jumping up and down, but yeah. I just wasn't motivated. And so getting the bike, my husband was really into it. And now I'm getting into spinning and it just is very convenient. And it, you know, yeah. I always say like 20 minutes is better than nothing. And the bike really Absolutely. does make it possible to do 20 minutes. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and it is funny too. And I've, I've talked on different other podcasts, especially speaking with other runners in, in relation to my running, like, you know, just because you do something in the past and like, it, like you don't have to define yourself or label yourself as something and, and kind of recognizing that in this season of life, you know, it's, it's 20 minutes is a workout. Like I think former me would be like, that's not a workout. And I'd be so wow. hard on myself or like walking isn't a workout or like, Oh, 20 minutes. That's nothing. You have to do like an hour to be anything, but it's not true. And, and I have a lot more compassion for myself now and, and kindness and, and cause yeah, the days, like when you're exhausted and you have, you know, a, a maybe napping child who might wake up any second, like if you can get it 20 minutes, amazing. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, um, that's awesome. Do you, are you doing any, or have you enjoyed any other sports or, um, like what kind of dance were you doing before? I loved if you're in New York city and listening, um, or I think if they're in other cities too now, 305 fitness was my jam. I went three to four days a week, even up to being 30 plus weeks pregnant. I was going and I love it and I miss it so much because it's, you know, creative and the movements change, you know, spinning, running, you're always doing the same movement and I got a little bored. I like the mind body connection where you're following along and you have to pay attention a little bit more. Yeah. Um, So that's my favorite. And I literally just haven't been able to get there in months. It's on the weekend. It's not like to leave my boys. It's not my first choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I did through a five fitness once and it was so like, like, I'm just not good at moving my body in that way. (laughs) I was like, an idiot. No, but I did it with a bunch of my um, mom friends. This was, I think, I don't know, probably was like six or six months or so after my, my first child. And I went with a bunch of new mom friends. And um, it was just so funny because it's one of those things where I feel like you really have to get the moves down in order to like get the workout, you know, like, so I was like, kind of like sitting there, like half doing some of the things and I'm not like the most coordinated person. I'm super klutzy and like, and like I can dance fine, but like doing like really coordinated moves is not, not my, my strong suit. Um, so yeah, I I was like kind of in the back, just like pretending to know what I was doing. And I was like, I'm never doing this again, but I have a lot of clients who love 305 fitness. So that's awesome. It's fun. There's like a live DJ. It's like a little party, which, you know, yeah, I like. Well, well, Peloton actually has live DJ rides, so if yeah, you're, you know, those. I have yeah, the, those. those are quite fun. Um, so what's on the horizon for you? What, uh, you know, what kind of projects would you like to share, or what's going on for you next? I have a few exciting projects that are coming up this spring, but one thing that I'm really excited about is I'm launching my first comprehensive group nutrition program. Um, it's an eight week this spring and it's coming. It's an eight week program to help women understand how to eat, to feel good through food, boost their energy and feel comfortable in their clothes without restriction, no strict diets or obsessing about food. So I'm sharing the exact steps that I take with my one-on-one clients in a group setting at a fraction of the cost so more women can feel confident in their skin and really understand how to properly fuel their body without depriving it. So I'm really excited to be bringing this to everyone and it's launching this spring. So if you want to find out, you can either follow me on Instagram or join my newsletter list where I'll be announcing it first. The wait list will be opening up soon and it's full of good stuff. I'm so excited. Awesome. Awesome. Congrats. I know that's like a huge endeavor putting together these group projects or courses or things like that. So yeah. that's great. Awesome. Good for you. Um, one thing I forgot to ask, just returning briefly to the food allergy thing. Can we discuss eating out for a second? I remember seeing, I think it was a post you did at one point that you had a scare with sesame or something. Um, you were out, you were on a date night and uh, yeah, it was a date night. And I think like you even administered the EpiPen and everything. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe you can share some experiences, whether it's personal or not, but, um, like that, or just some advice on people with eating out who have allergies and how you recommend handling those things. 
Yeah. So the post you were talking about, it was a few months postpartum. I went out to dinner with my husband, got all dressed finally and got put on makeup for once, got out of the house. And my husband, whenever we go out to eat, and this is something I recommend, first of all, you have to do it based on your comfort level. So if you feel Mm -hmm. like you are, you feel comfortable and it's always a risk. If you have a severe food allergy, you are always putting yourself at risk when you do eat out because your allergy is probably in the kitchen, unless if the place is a hundred percent free from your allergen. But I, we call ahead, we always call ahead and ask about the allergy. Can you handle this food allergy? What's your protocol to make sure that the restaurant is able to do so? And then Mm -hmm. when we get there, we, as soon as we sit down, my, we tell them about my allergy. And then when we order again, we always tell them about my allergy and this particular night. And whenever I go out to eat, I also choose very simple food because I like to see what's in my food. And of course, any allergy can always be hidden. Mm -hmm. You will not always it it's very important but I do like to see my food as well and I ordered a really plain piece of fish I said get the sauce on this side we double checked double check with the chef there's no none of my allergies in it and when it came the fish was there the sauce was on the side in like its own separate dish and I go to take a bite of the fish which was just simply grilled And then a server comes back over and goes, you didn't eat this yet, did you? And I had a bite of the fish and I was like, what's wrong? And immediately my body went into shock. I was so nervous. Turns out that the sauce had sesame in it or something like that. I didn't end up administering my EpiPen. I was like running around the restaurant, talking to the chef, saying it's only in the sauce, right? I like took a few Benadryl just in case. Uh. And everything was fine because I had only had a bite of the fish, but it was a very close call. And... It really, anytime you have a scare in a restaurant, and I've actually had a couple in the past few years versus growing up, I had zero. It's really scary, and it can be really paralyzing for anybody with allergies for the next time you go eat, and it can make dining out a really anxiety-inducing experience. So I would just say, you know, make sure, number one, always call up and ask them how they handle allergies. Make sure that you're comfortable with it. Always tell your server multiple times that you have your allergy. Double check when you place your order. Ask them to ask the chef. Double check when your food comes before you eat it as well. And then always have your emergency plan ready to go. So I had Benadryl and my EpiPens in my bag. So in case Mm -hmm. of an emergency. So Claire, make sure you always. I know, I know, I know. I I fight. Well, okay. You're going to yell at me. I realize, and this is like, of course, pregnancy and everything. I realized I was carrying around. Around, like EpiPens that were like several years outdated. <laughs> like, two years. Yeah, you have to make sure that they're not expired. They're 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 now not. They're I, my mom was like, uh, "Have you got an EpiPen recently?" I'm like, "Yeah, probably." No, I did not. So I have have new ones. They're they're dispersed among you know all my bags. <laughs> but yeah, it was really bad. Um, you know, I mean that just sounds so stressful. Like, I mean, even growing up with that and, and, but like eating out and, and just, ugh, that, that just sounds so stressful. Um, and I know now, and I don't know, sorry, go ahead. Oh, in all honesty, like growing up, we ate out not all the time, but you know, my mom would always cook dinner. And then on the weekends, there was usually like a night or two that we would go out or, and I never, I've traveled, I've lived in other countries. And I never had the anxiety that I do now about my food allergies, even though I was tested and apparently some of them went away. I still operate like they're all still there because I haven't done the oral challenge yet but growing up I was never I never had an incident I told him about my allergies I was never worried it was just I don't know if I just got lucky or you know if it just the restaurants we went to were safe um but it was never really an issue and all the traveling and all of the dining out that I've done in the past. And then in the past few years, I don't know if because of all these intolerances, like people, everyone is saying that they have a gluten intolerance, maybe restaurant servers just aren't taking allergies as seriously as they should. Yeah, It is definitely something that needs to be taken seriously. It needs to be enforced. And it's, it's, it's somebody you always you're putting your life at risk when you go out to eat and it can be a very yeah. anxiety inducing experience there have been several times since I've had these few scares where I'll just sit there and just don't feel comfortable eating because either I feel like uh, the servers didn't fully hear me or I'm just yeah. not comfortable or it looks really busy the kitchen's yeah. a mess. 
So I would rather just be safe and sorry, enjoy the social company of going out, and then yeah. you can always eat something later. It's not the end yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that that's hard. And, and I mean, you're saying that some of the work that you do is helping people not feel restricted. And even though, you know, you obviously eat like a variety of different foods, like that is being restricted socially. And that's, that's just a tough situation. Um, yeah. But my, my, I guess my follow up question to that, sorry, I know we're like going back to this discussion, <laughs> but I'm thinking of all these things I forgot to ask you. Um, uh, but, you know, we're seeing now, and, and you, of course, have an eight month old, and I don't know if you plan to send her daycare at some point, but I mean, in schools, you know, it's like, like growing up, you know, we would have peanut butter and jelly or something like that, or, or you wouldn't, obviously, but, um, you know, it wasn't like a thing where you wouldn't bring nuts and things like that to schools and now it's pretty much standard practice yeah. because of the rise of you know nut allergies and such you know why why is that happening do you have any kind of thoughts on that so allergies are on the rise and they say in the U.S. and they say that it's because we weren't because allergies were prevalent then people were told oh don't expose your allergy your kids to okay. these allergens until later that's why sort of like reversing the the rhetoric of this, you know, now the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that we introduce these allergens earlier to reduce the incidence of allergies. And hopefully over time, while people follow these um, recommendations, we see the prevalence of allergies drop and or the incidence of allergies drop and less people are diagnosed with new allergies because of this. But it's definitely, you know, it's definitely really common. I mean, I didn't have a nut-free school growing up. I didn't go to a nut-free camp growing up. And now it really is such commonplace. Mm, yeah. Um, and I'm remembering a question that I meant to ask you also a while back that when I lost my train of thought, uh, gluten, dairy, and thyroid. That's something I always get clients who have some sort of thyroid issue. Well, not always, but you know, I sometimes get these clients and their doctors are recommending the removal of both dairy and gluten. I'm guessing that's because of this supposed link to inflammation, but I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, there is some evidence that removing dairy and gluten can help with thyroid hormone balance. Um, I just think it's very individualized based on what the client needs, what the thyroid dysfunction is, um, and what else they're eating and, you know, what their lifestyle is. So again, I think a very individualized approach is necessary. Not every patient with a thyroid disorder needs to eliminate gluten and dairy. Yeah. Okay. That that's pretty much was my thinking, but I was curious what your thoughts were. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And and the next uh, part of this interview, of course, are my Quick Bites questions. So we'll just launch right into that. Favorite meal or snack when in a hurry? Probably sun butter with any, on it, like anything. Like an apple, toast, a spoonful, anything. It's sunflower seed butter. Have, it's my favorite. Awesome. Do you have a favorite sunflower seed butter brand that you like or... Some, but, some butter is my favorite and I do work with them um, because uh -huh. they are made in a nut-free facility. Not all sunflower oh, nice. butters are made in a nut-free facility and peanut-free facilities. So they are 100% safe for people with those allergies. Oh, okay. And what bars do you typically recommend to people? Because I know I, I certainly have clients who, um, you know, just avoid all bars and especially like with my athletes yeah. who need like quick, convenient things. I know there's like 88 acres, but yeah. do, are you aware of other, what other brands do you like, um, in the they're bar really, realm? They're really one of the only, in terms of like allergy friendly, they're really, really? one of the okay. only ones. It's really is a, uh, sparse space. Wow. Okay. Well, so if any listeners are looking to, uh, fill a need, <laughs> uh, so, or maybe that's next on your list is, is I'm actually, do you have a recipe for, like yeah, a, I just posted oh. actually a chocolate brownie energy bar oh, it's made perfect. with no added sugar. It's just like dates, sunflower seed butter, sunflower awesome. seeds. It's pretty easy to whip up. Okay, so that is definitely going to go in the show notes because <laughs> any of my uh, listeners who have allergies, who can't have like the RX bars and Kind bars and all that stuff yeah. will can make this instead. Awesome. Uh, favorite meal or snack when not in a hurry? It's probably still some butter on anything. I <laughs> <laughs> a jar a week um that's like all I eat and I'm always in a hurry now so I don't even know um yeah, probably something yeah. Italian though I love like pizza or like a good piece of or something Mediterranean like a Greek salad with like a piece of fish is one okay. of my favorite meals awesome um biggest cooking catastrophe oh well well I tried to make cod once and 
I did. I think I did a good job, but it's a it's a very oily fish. The first time I not once, the first time I made cod, because um, I was always just like a salmon type of person or like a flaky white fish. But cod is a much oilier fish, so it it I just my husband and I really didn't even like the taste of it, and we ordered pizza. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have any of your recipes been like total fails? That that's like probably one of the only ones. Of course, really? okay. I had, Oh, I test like everything a few times, maybe like the texture is not good or, you know, it didn't stick together the way I wanted it to. And so I'll retest. I test everything multiple times before publishing it to my blog. But I think I made like four batches of pancakes on Wednesday uh, for a rest <laughs> of coming next week. But um, usually it's edible, though. Like there are very few times where I make something. I can't even think of the last time where I literally have to throw it out because it's inedible and I hate wasting food. Yeah. Oh, my God. Me, too. I, I definitely have like cooked things before. Like, I don't know, maybe I've made like a batch of chili that somehow like you think like it's impossible to mess up chili. But I think I messed it up one time. And it just tasted like not great. And Eric's just like looking like, do I have to eat this? I'm like, yep, you're going to be eating this for the next three nights. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. OK, cool. Um, most bizarre or exotic food that you've ever tried? I'm really not too adventurous, probably because I have like a proceed with caution attitude because of my allergies. Yeah. But I did once have uni or sea urchin and I was not a fan okay really what did it taste like was this really fishy not good (laughs) I don't know not good yeah got it how do you like your eggs cooked if you eat eggs um scrambled or in an omelet or in protein pancakes Ooh, yum and uh wine beer or liquor if you drink uh I'm not a huge drinker but when I do drink it's wine and only white you just don't like red it's just yeah. a preference. Yeah. I don't like red. My husband has like really likes really dry reds also. So oh, I, yeah, I can't do that. Yeah. It's just not for me. Yeah. Plus it stains uh, your teeth and I don't like that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what foods remind you of growing up or what are your comfort foods? I would only eat two meals at my grandma's house growing up. And it, the, those were like what stand out to me for my childhood the most. And that was her meatballs and spaghetti and her chicken cutlets and those stale whenever I see them bring me back to childhood where did you grow up I grew up on Long Island in New York oh, okay awesome and what's your well, you said you're not a big ice cream person so maybe you don't have a favorite ice cream flavor so if you don't like ice cream what's your favorite treat I like ice cream I'm just not oh, okay. like I'm not the type of person who could like eat ice cream all winter long when I'm cold. Like if I'm hot, if it's hot out and it's like a summer day, then I can eat ice cream. But, um, and I always went growing up, we went to this place that had like homemade old fashioned ice cream and it had like oh, the yum. biggest Oreo chunks ever. Oh that my God. So my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Cookies and cream. Oh, so yeah. good. So good. What, so when it's cold, what is your favorite treat? Um, uh, either making hot chocolate mm-hmm. or I'm like a sucker for a good cookie. Hmm. Awesome. Any favorite cookies in New York City? No, because I don't really eat cookies out because of my allergies. Oh, that's right. Okay, so you're just so using like, cooking your own. We live two blocks away from Levine Bakery, and I just like uh, they all their cookies practically. Two of their cookies don't have nuts, but because of cross-contamination, yeah. I really can't ever eat anything from bakeries, which I have serious envy. So like with food oh. allergies, you can actually have restrictions, and you just can't yeah. like eat as freely, but, you know, it's... Yeah, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm still mourning the end of Birdbath um, of uh, City Bakery. They had the best chocolate chip cookie ever. I like so sad. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I always ask this question. I'm not sure it's as relevant to you, but maybe it is. <laughs> Top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. Because you are still active. Yeah, so, so I'm I've asking that. Very active. A good pair of sneakers. I wear Nike sneakers. I've been buying the same exact pair over and over. And I think it's also really important that you update your sneakers. I th- What is it, like every yeah. six months? I think yeah. that's really or, important. Or miles based, but yeah. Uh-huh. Or, yeah, you would know more than I would. But I think that's really important. Um, and then I became obsessed with Align leggings in my, when I was pregnant. Oh, yes. Lululemon. Lulu, yes, I, have, like, I basically live in those. Scratch. I would like wore them to the hospital when I was 39 weeks pregnant and they still fit me now. They didn't stretch yeah. out. It's, um, yeah. although it makes me question things, but yeah. <laughs> it, uh, they're amazing. They're so comfortable. It's like, you're not even wearing pants. 
Yep, pretty much. But I also really like, those are expensive, but I also really like for working out, Old Navy has great high-waisted compression yeah. leggings. I have probably 10 pairs. Those are like my go-to because they're affordable, they're comfortable. Yeah. I love Old Navy's leggings. Oh, yeah. No, I, I lived in their maternity activewear. Like, like F, uh, it was it was Gap and Old Navy. But, yeah, their bras and their tops. And, and yeah, when if I didn't want to really invest in, like, really expensive workout gear for pregnancy, yeah, I did that. And and I think I have, like, I think four pairs of live leggings that I pretty much only wear leggings these days, which is pretty sad. Yep. But, I mean, you're, you, you do – I mean, we didn't mention it here, but you do 100% virtual counseling, too, right now, like I yeah. do. And I mean, I'm literally sitting here in my pajamas right now. I mean, I mean, I, I literally showered and put on clean pajamas. <laughs> like, like, I put why on would jeans I today. I put oh, on jeans today. It's a win. Good. It's a win. That is a huge <laughs> win. Yeah, I mean, I haven't left the house again. And that is something I will say that it's, I felt just because it's winter and now I'm virtual before, after my first child, I was going uptown to an office a couple days a week. And it's like, I really, it's finding reasons to get dressed. It's, it's very hard. <laughs> I need, I need to just get dressed and, and leave the house for like five minutes just to get some air. But, um, but yeah, it, it's easy just to like be trapped in here and, and not really have uh, much contact outside my family, which is very sad. <laughs> Yeah, so at least I'm seeing people out. on the video. I know, I know, I have to get up. Um, anyways, well, thank you so much for coming on, Chelsea. This is a really fun discussion, and you know, it was, it was great learning from you and and your experiences with allergies. So thank, thank you, so you for your for time. Having me. Yeah, awesome. So I will, of course, post in the show notes how everyone can find you, and and yeah, what is your website and and your Instagram handle so people can can check you out. Yeah, I can be found at Chelsea Amer Nutrition. It's Chelsea C H E L S E Y Amer A M E R Nutrition um, dot com or on Instagram. That's my handle. Pretty basic. So I'd love for you to come say hi. And if you want to join, I have a Facebook group, a private Facebook group. It's an accountability group. So if you want to join, also there's a link through my Instagram bio. Perfect. Awesome. And I'll, of course, link to all this in the show notes. So thank you again, Chelsea, and good luck with everything and and your family and enjoy the Peloton. (laughs) Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Bye. I hope you guys enjoyed my chat with Chelsea. Definitely check her out on her website, follow her on Instagram or elsewhere. She really has a lot of good recipes and and other posts. So um, yeah, so give her a follow. I'll of course link to everything in the show notes as well, including that delicious sounding recipe. I really appreciate your support. You know, this is still a, a fun little passion project of mine. So if you like this episode and previous episodes and would like me to continue to create similar content, please consider giving me a review or rating on iTunes, share it with your friends. I'd love to get more listeners um, so I can continue to grow this show. So thanks as always for your support, guys. Have a good one.